And you have to see this thing, this flying thread of what you have to squint. Oh, no, I'm kidding. But I've always been a big fan of Art Deco from the time I was very small, even smaller than I am now. <laughs> my, my dear friend Sharon Kaskov really got me hooked, and, and I love every single bit of it, everything. Tamarita Lampica was a diva. If you know what a diva is, she probably was the one for, the, for whom the word was made. She was a great beauty, as you can see. She looked, for, to me, a, a lot like Veronica Lake. She was very Garbo-esque in her way. She dressed beautifully. She, she escaped from the Bol Bolsheviks in Russia. She made a fortune from her work, and all of this enabled Tamara de Lampica to live the high life in Paris, where she began to create stunning Art Deco work. And then she came to New York, and she ended up in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And so of all the painters who pursued this Art Deco style, Tamara is one of the most memorable. She was born Maria Gorska, to a very well-to-do family in St. Petersburg, or Pet however you would, Petrograd, before it was St. Petersburg. And, and parents divorced. And she was fine. Her mother was happy. She had a grandma who was like an Auntie Mame, who spoiled her, traveled with her as a child, took her to every possible museum that was available, educated her about composition and painting and color. And, and Tamara, just like a lot of artists like Picasso and others, was very bored with going to school. And she spent her time daydreaming about a world in which she would be, which she expected to have an adoring public. But her only question was, what was she going to do to get this adoration? And so when war was declared between Germany on August 1st, 1914, by the way, she was 99 and she lived to 1980. Tamara, at, at the beginning of the war, was, um, was with her mother. And, and was, um, they wanted to evacuate from Petrograd, but at the same time, her mother was remarrying. And like a very naughty child, she reacted to that with great tantrums. And so her aunt, her mother's sister, who was now living, living in, um, in France, said, why don't you send her to live with me? I have two sons. She would round up my family. And Tamara was thrilled. And the aunt was married to a very wealthy banker. And she had, like, like all of our mothers, she had a big jewelry box. And there was a drawer of pearls, a drawer of diamonds, a drawer of emeralds, and a drawer of sapphires. And every night that her aunt went out in Paris, she would ask, ask uh, Tamara to pick out the jewels. And of course, Tamara tried them on. And it was at that point that she precisely decided when she wanted, or what she wanted to do when she grew up. She wanted to be rich and she wanted lots of jewels. <laughs> and so at 15 years old, Tamara began to fall in love with this fellow. He was an attorney, he, he, um, he, and she was determined to have him. And his name was Tadus Lempiki. She became Tamara de Lempika. And he was quite a ladies' man. The women loved him. He was very attractive, but he didn't work. Even though he was an attorney, he was extremely lazy and penniless. However, his, uh, Tamara was completely smitten with him, and she didn't stop talking about him. And if any of you have had young daughters, you know what I'm talking about. And so her uncle decided when she was about 19 years old that what he would do is he would go to see Lem Picky and he would offer him a dowry. If he would please take his niece off his hands, 
he couldn't stand the nagging anymore. And so, of course, then Peggy, who was penniless, decided that that would be his way to have a wonderful life. And the uncle said, if you marry my, my niece, I will give you a very large dowry for her. And so they were married in, in uh, St. Petersburg. And the winter there was very, very cold, at which it probably is still cold. And people, people were very poor. They didn't dress in their in, well, the population there was very poor, but there were still these very, very wealthy people. And high society would fill buckets of champagne with the shades drawn. But the Lempickings were living there, Tamara and Tadus, and Tadus still wasn't working. They were living off her money. Most of the Russians lived off the jewels that they had. They kept selling them and, and uh, turning them into rent and food. And when Lenin led the Bolsheviks into Petrograd and took over the government, um, her uncle and her aunt moved to Copenhagen. A lot of people fled fled Russia when they could. And her husband, Tadus Lempicki, was arrested by the secret police and he was taken away. She was only 19 years old, very, very brave. And without dressing us fantasiously, she went from prison to prison looking for her husband. And somehow, she got him out, probably by, by paying a very large sum of money. We really don't know how she did it. And on June 18, 1918, the Tsar and his family were shot to death. And Europe was overrun with impoverished refugees. And Tamara finally was able to meet up with her husband, who she loved very much, um, in, 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 um, in Copenhagen, and and a lot of the Russians would trade on their names. They would sell their names, like in Downton Abbey. We've all seen that, or we're waiting for the new movie. And and here here's Paris. And so what she found, though, was that Tandus was no longer carefree. He had become very sullen. He refused to get a job to help both of them. And, and uh, she was very disappointed in him. A lot, of the per a lot of the Russians who came to Paris drove taxis, worked as models for Pierre Poiret, things like that. They were no longer the sophisticated um, people that they had been in St. Petersburg. And Tamara got pregnant, and she had a little baby who she loved. Her name was Cosette, and her husband still refused to get a job. He said it was beneath him to work, and they had violent arguments. And Tamara had a sister. Her name was Adrienne, and she said to Tamara, you always love to paint and draw. What I want you to do is, or I suggest that you make money as an artist. And that's what Tamara decided to do. That night she went out, she bought paints, she bought brushes, but she wasn't satisfied with her work. And she started to take private lessons from these two gentlemen. Maurice Denis is, was a nobby. He, and he, he taught her about composition. And Andre Lot was more to her style, his work, was kind of bordered on Art Deco. And she started very, very, um, very enthusiastically. Her sister was an architecture student and brought one of her professors to uh, Tamara's, uh, Tamara's atelier. And, and, and he said, if you keep painting the way you are, he, you will this is not Tamara's, believe me, but, <laughs> no, but he said, if you keep painting the way you've been painting, you will probably be successful. So at that point, she took a trip to, to Italy. She saw Pontormo's work, which is very mannerist, very elongated. Um, 
very, very lean. And she also loved the work of Botticelli. She particularly loved Botticelli. And, and then she came back to, to um, Paris. And, and she, um, she learned, she continued to learn from La Haute. He was the father of synthetic cubism. And cubism, of course, started by Picasso and Brock in dark grays and browns. And that is um, analytic cubism. Oh, if we can just look again and use color. So that's called synthetic cubism. And it's more advanced than what Picasso and Brock had started with. And, and he also told her, La Haute told her, that she should take a look at Ang, Jean-Dominique Ang, who also elongated his figures, uh, put arms where they really didn't belong to make the composition more beautiful. And so she, she decided to start signing her papers, Tamara instead of Marie, Tamara de Lempica. And she acquired, she got into a gallery in Paris and she sold two paintings and she was beginning to live the life that she really dreamed of. She loved to travel. She met all the, the people there. She knew Picasso, Fujita Chagall, Moshe Kiesling, and many others. And she began to make money and she was able to eat Maxime's at the Ritz and sometimes, and she never brought her husband with her, he was such a pill. So she, um, she would make dinner for, he, he must have been awful to live with. And anyway, she, she would make dinner for him and for her daughter. And then she would go out, have dinner at Maxime's, a, a wonderful dinner with some friends. And then she would come back maybe it was nine, 10 o'clock at night, and she would go into her studio and paint until 6 a.m. She was a very strict and demanding mother, not a very kind one. She used her daughter a great deal to, um, to pose for her. And, and she would very often, if I can go back to Cosette, or I won't because I, I'm limited in time, but she would take Cosette with her to Monte Carlo, and they were both very blonde. And so she had this little child with wonderfully blonde hair who looked a lot like her mother. And a lot of the gentlemen in Monte Carlo would say, can I buy lunch for you? And so she and her daughter were, were recognized by Vogue magazine for being very unique, for being uh, very, very beautiful. And Vogue magazine, wrote about them, what they wore, where they went. She was getting the kind of publicity that people dream about. And it was during the early years in Paris that Tamara developed what her daughter called her killer instinct. She had a code, and it was a code for the 1920s. She wasn't interested in anybody except the high born, the rich, and the accomplished. In other words, people who, um, people who could help her. And Ernest Hemingway, Fitzgerald said the same thing about him. He said, Fitzgerald never lend, lend a hand to anyone unless they were above him. And so Tamara was very interested in moving ahead. And she wore very expensive clothes to look dazzling. And she kept her past in, in cloaked in mystery. She never told anybody about her being born in Poland, about her time in Russia, about anything of her past. She was very sophisticated, very glamorous. And from the start, she knew how to bank on her style. And so her art became what we call Art Deco. And it fit with the traditional subjects with modern techniques. And when the minister of the Beaux-Arts, the, the Association of Art Decorators, opened its first exhibition in Paris, she was ready and she was, she was 
a place I've never been. She was in the right place at the right time. And one might say that she was an absolutely exemplary artist of the art And even though nobody uh, really saw too many of her paintings, they knew who she was. And so she felt that art, which Kandinsky and people like who, uh, Mondrian, who were doing um, who were doing abstraction, she said that painting was only about destruction. And she didn't like that. And she said, I want to create a new style with light and bright colors and return elegance to painting. And so she met this gentleman. She met this gentleman, Emmanuel Castel Barco. He was the son-in-law of um, Arturo Toscanini. So he, he was, she was in very good hands. And he had just opened a new gallery in Milan. And she showed him photographs of her work. And six months later, um, she had a show at his gallery. She had worked night and days to come, night and day to come up with 30 paintings for the show, because that was the number that he requested. And so here are some of them, and you can see they're extremely elongated or mannerist, um, absolutely beautiful. She liked women, and she certainly liked men and had wonderful adventures. And if we look at some of her work, you can see Cubist-type buildings, skyscrapers that were very popular in New York, in, in um, London, in her work. And, and she did many, many paintings. I thought I would, I would show them to you, but they have this wonderful style. They're all this absolutely beautiful, magnificent color. She used cassette a great deal. And Castel Barco introduced her to one of his friends, Marquis Somi Picardi. And she had many lovers. I have him some, uh, somewhere. And she also had another look. She had multiple lovers, and why not? And so she had Gabriel D'Annunzio. And, and he was a very, very famous writer at that time. And, and she, um, she endeared herself to him. And she believed, because he was very famous at that time, she believed that by painting him, she would do a masterpiece. And that would be her entry into the world of fame. And so they would, they would um, meet all the time, but the painting never got off the ground. And in 1927, her career really began to take off. And she no longer needed the connection with him. And, and um, she never saw him again, again. But he gave her a huge topaz and diamond ring that she wore every day of her life until until there was no more. And the decade between the end of the war and the demise of Wall Street that we call the Warring Twenties was dominated by these rich, uh, rich, ruthless merchant businessmen who set the tone of the times. And so they became obsessed with living well, with making a name for themselves, and they were writing books, and she was in the middle of all of this. She, she was making a great deal of money with her painting. People, people asked to pose for her. Her prices went up. And, and here she is posing one of her models. And one day in Monte Carlo, she had been shopping in one of Chanel's shops. She uh, came out to find on her windshield a little note that said, you look so wonderful in the car. Now, this was not the car she was driving. She was wearing yellow, and she was driving a yellow Renault. And so she, uh, the, the note said, 
I would love to meet you. And it was signed by a woman's name and she was staying in a hotel that was nearby. It turned out that the writer of the car was a fashionable um, German magazine editor of the magazine Die, Die Dam. And she asked to marry to do a painting of herself in the yellow car with the yellow dress. And of course, Tamara painted herself in this green Bugatti rather than the remote, no, because as she said, she preferred this car. And so this painting has become iconic of the Art Deco period. If you think about a woman in a car in the Art Deco period, this is it. And so, Tamara um, was also very attractive to beautiful women. She would just meet them on the street at the opera, give them her card, and ask them to please come up and be painted. In, 19, um, in 1927, she was completing this huge painting, which belonged to Barbara Streisand. Do you know that Frida Kahlo um, was owned by Madonna and it kind of made everybody want a Frida Kahlo painting. Well, this one was owned by Barbara Streisand and it went up on auction. And of course, people were, were desperate to have a Tamara de Lampica. But there's a wonderful story here and I love it. So Tamara was painting Eve and Eve is holding an apple and it suddenly occurred to her while this nude model is on, on the stand posing that she needed an Adam. Upstairs, walked the street till she found a very handsome policeman and said, do you mind, I need an Adam, would you mind posing? He probably thought she was very cute. And so he came up and he sees this nude model who's posing, he thought she was cute. And he takes off his uniform and puts it down and goes up and poses with this beautiful young lady for Adam and Eve. And, and it took a week for Tamara to get the painting that she wanted, and it took two weeks for them to get married. And see, isn't that, I love it. Anyway, she, um, she was really disgusted with her husband at that point. She was, uh, she called him wet, a failure, or that imbecile. And she really had had enough of him. She was tired of supporting him, and he was furious at her. He, she, he said, she embarrassed me painting her lovers. Everybody knew that. And he wasn't, you know, I don't know if they had anything to do with each other after the birth of Cassette. Anyway, she never told me. Anyway, um, so in this unfinished portrait that she did of Lempicki, her husband, she omitted to paint, I hope you can see it, she omitted to paint this hand and she left off his wedding ring. This painting is now in the Pompidou Art Center in France. She enjoyed great success as a painter. Here are two of, two of her male paintings. She did males and females. This fellow was one of her lovers, and so it's a very big painting. Okay, and she bumped into this fellow, Baron Kufner. Baron Kufner, and he wanted a painting of his mistress. And, and um, he wanted this painting of his mistress. And Tamara thought, his, here's the mistress. She was the, an Andalusian dancer named Nina or Nana de Herrera. And, and uh, Tamara didn't like her at all. She thought she was very ugly and she really wanted to cover her face with lace in the painting, but she resisted. Anyway, she, later she used her for one of the four women, I believe it's this top one, uh, this top one. She, later she used her for one of the four women called Group of Four Nudes, in which she depicted her as vulgar, primitive, lascivious, appearing as though she's possessed by the devil. And so guess what? Tamara 
would place Nana as the Baron's mistress. And when his, when his real wife died, because he was married, in 1933, he married Tamara. And she had everything she ever wanted then. She had a title, she had lots of money, she had status in the community, and people were fighting to get their portraits done by her. And she did what every artist would love to do, to say, no, I don't want to paint your picture. And she just chose who to paint. And she then met this scientist, his name was Buka, Bukhard. He made a fortune inventing a drug called Lactiol, which fights irritable bowel syndrome. Very romantic. And he would buy up a year of her paintings ahead of time. He was crazy about her work and he loved this two women on a couch that he owned. And he wanted paintings of himself and of his wife and daughter. I couldn't find those paintings. And then she came to America for a month and worked another mistress for Rufus Bush. I don't think he's one of them, but Rufus Bush who owned a cattle brand. And she really loved America. And, and when she returned home and they were living in, in Hungary, she noticed a group of blonde Hitler youth marching and singing in the neighborhood. And she had no intention losing all of the money, all of the jewels, all of the clothes she had amassed. And she made the Baron sell all of his holdings and move to the United States. And the stress that she felt is very evident. Some of her paintings have skulls and, and blood and things. And this is, this is the mother superior who's crying. And Cosette began to realize what the, the painter Jean Cocteau had predicted. He said, Tamara's social life is going to corrupt her art. Once Tamara set foot in the United States, um, Tamara de Lampica disappeared, and what was left was a very chic curiosity named the Baroness Kufner, who was more interested in socializing, partying, and shopping. And first she and the Baron went to, went to California, to Hollywood. She, she painted a lot of portraits out there. They're very difficult to find, but I did find this one that she did of, um, oh, what's his name? I forgot. Thank you. Oh, I knew you would know. Okay. So, so she, um, she had a lot of shows in New York at one of the big contemporary galleries, Julie, Julian Levy's, which was a tremendous gallery in New York at the time, and she also showed in San Francisco. And the Baron had had enough of Hollywood, and he insisted that they move to New York, and they purchased a stunning two-story apartment at 322 East 57th Street and wonderful north light, which artists want because the shadows don't move. And, and, she, and she began using a palette knife. She began to really experiment. But what I love most about her living in New York, she always painted in an evening gown because you never knew who would ring the bell. And she wanted to look right. And so she... Um, the apartment was decorated with wonderful antiques, but abstract art was now in vogue. And Tamara's paintings really began to slip out of favor. You know how fickle people can be. And so realism, what the Kooning and 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 uh, what and Pollock and and many of uh, and Rothko, they were they were on the main stage and she was getting pushed back so she she started to paint abstractly and her new work was delicate almost pastel in color i'll show you some here but i'd rather show you her old paints aren't they beautiful 
They are just incredible. And and thanks to Mara, she was absolutely stunning to Venice. She and her husband had a wonderful life touring the world. This is her apartment, another window or another view of her apartment. She is in an evening gown, probably ready to go into her studio. And so she was a very difficult woman. She was critical, she was selfish, and she was a terrible mother, very demanding of her. And and that got married. She married um, someone who worked for Dow Chemicals and, and lived in Houston. And she had two daughters. And so um, she, she was constantly asking her daughter for favors, come and take care of me. And, and Cosette said, my husband, her husband had cancer. He was very sick. He was in the hospital. And Tamara would say, Tamara would say that, uh, leave your husband, hire somebody up more important. And so in 1978, oh, that's one of her paintings. I'm sorry you can't see it, but it's very pastel, a lot of turquoise, a lot of pink. In 1978, Tamara moved to Cuernavaca permanently in Mexico. It's a beautiful little city, but I lived there as well. And, and Cosette was preoccupied with her husband, who was at this point terminally ill with lung cancer. And she really said, Mother, I can't indulge your whims anymore. I have to be with my husband. And Tamara would constantly say, your husband's in the hospital. Come to see me for three days. And, and um, she threatened her daughter that if she didn't come, she was going to leave this beautiful home to a young Mexican sculptor that she had met, a young man. And she saw Lo Cassette's loyalty her, to her husband as a betrayal. And cause poor Cassette was now shuffling back and forth between Houston and Cuernavaca. And when her husband died, she was then able, her daughters were grown up, she was able to move to Mexico to be near her mother, who only had three months to live. In 1980, Cosette fulfilled her mother's last wish by hiring a helicopter and scattering Tamara's ashes into the crater of a very, very um, active volcano a vol in Mexico. The activity has never quite died down. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So we have time for one or two questions. Okay. Yeah. One or two questions, anyone in the audience, for our uh, wonderful... For Tamara Delampica. About, yes, about this topic. Yes. She lived the most in Paris. She loved Paris. Who doesn't love Paris? I dare you to raise your hand. And she was a marvelous painter, very, very productive. So she was, I, I would say, very serious. But after a certain point, because I'm a painter myself, you get tired. You want to have a little more fun. And so when she got to New York and she had a million friends and connections and all those wonderful restaurants and shops to visit, her painting kind of slowed down and she never got it back. She tried. She could never rekindle the wonderful art that she had done before. Yes. Uh, 82. 82. Oh, she was 82 when she died. Yes. And what happened to her Polish husband? Did he... Oh, I don't care. <laughs> I had no idea. You know, I've thought of that myself. He probably found some other rich woman. But did they divorce? They must have she divorced him and she married Baron Kufner. Yes. Tell us two minutes about yourself. Do you teach? Do you professor? Uh, yes, I teach at FAU and, and I teach at Palm Beach State and I'm about to retire in two weeks. Uh -huh. Yes. And, and, 
and paint, okay? I wish you all a wonderful rest of this marvelous convention. It's really fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much.